Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're gonna hear some practical teaching from God's word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the giving tab and choose online campus as your campus. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Manual Church, are we feeling good today? Let me hear it. How you guys doing today? We doing all right? Having a good day so far? Hey, thank you so much for coming out. I know we got some new folks with us today, whether you're joining us here in person at our Greenwood campus, Banta campus, Franklin campus, Garfield Park, or whether you're joining us online, if you are new today, thank you so much for coming to check out one of our services. Can we give it up for anybody that's new checking out one of our services today? Thank you for accepting somebody's invite. That means a lot to us. We hope you've had a great time. And if you are not new today, welcome back. It's good to be with all of you guys. If I've never met you before, my name is Cody Johnson. I am the Emmanuel Church Greenwood campus pastor. And today I get the privilege of closing out our series titled Mercy. So this is week number four, the pre, the three previous weeks we've been talking a lot about the mercy of God and what a massive topic it has been. And if you've missed it, if you missed any of the first three weeks, it's all good. You can actually head to our YouTube channel, search Emmanuel Church, look for that lower case E, go to the channel. And then there's a playlist where you can click mercy and all three of the, the talks from the previous weeks are going to be there. So I can give you kind of a little rundown, a little recap. I won't go super in depth with it because you can check that out yourself. But during week one, we talked about the way of mercy, kind of laid out the bedrock and that foundation of the mercy of God and what that is, how we receive it. And then in week number two, we talked about the fact that God is different than human beings. He's different than us. He never casts us out. He is quick to love. He is slow to anger. He wants to lavish us with mercy. That is his go-to response. He doesn't cancel people. He doesn't drop people just because he feels like doing it. He's always quick with the mercy. And then last week, man, last week was a good one. We talked about this idea that we have an advocate. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He goes before us to God to hit that mercy button on our behalf when we mess things up or when we drop the ball. We also talked about how we have an accuser. Satan, our enemy, is labeled as the accuser in Scripture. We talked about how Jesus, the advocate, helps us go to battle with those temptations and with the accuser as well. And now we're in week number four. And man, I got a question for you. What do we do with this? What do we do? Like, this is a massive idea. Like, I can't imagine if you're new with us today, if you're somebody like me that didn't grow up in church and this concept of the mercy of God, the all-knowing, all-powerful God of the universe, like, he gives me mercy. Like, are you kidding me? And even if you've been coming to church for decades, man, like, once this really hits you, that hits you right between the eyes, it's gonna make you think and it makes you think, like, do I do anything with this? Do I, do I respond at all? And as we're going to see today, we're going to dive in deep into Scripture today. We're going to be talking about John 8. We're going to be talking Luke chapter 7, Matthew chapter 18. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you may want to get them ready because we're going to be going in pretty quick. And if you're online, you can use the app as well. If you're with us, you can use the app, use the Bible portion of that app. But today, Jesus is going to show us definitively this big idea that mercy requires a response. There is something to be done. Mercy requires a response. But if we're being honest with ourselves today, doing a little self-examination over the past few weeks, I think we could all come to understand that we struggle with this idea just a little bit. And here's how we would kind of theorize this idea. We don't respond to God's mercy in a way that honors God. We struggle with this a whole lot. There's a few different ways that we struggle with this. In week number one, we talked about a few different ideas. We talked about this idea that sometimes we settle in. Once this idea of mercy kind of becomes a little numb for us, it kind of becomes routine, we kind of settle in. We see ourselves as the type of person, you know, I'm never going to lead a small group. I'm never going to be able to be the type of person who reads their Bible regularly. I'm never going to show up to church in a routine manner. I'm just going to settle in. I just accept it. It's whatever. Some of us drift away. We talked about that during week number one. Sometimes if things are going really well and they're going really great, man, we're at church. We're like row number three. We're feeling good. My life is together. But if it's not going so well, like you may not see these people. You may not see us for a month. You may not see us for two months because we think, oh, I don't deserve the mercy of God. I don't deserve any of this love. I don't deserve this church, which we all know is not true. Sometimes some of us slip into legalism, kind of like the Pharisees that we're getting ready to talk about in John chapter 8. 
where we think it's all about the outside instead of the heart transformation that goes on the inside. It's about rules, regulations. It's about what we wear, how my hair looks. Am I following these laws exactly to the letter? And that's what's gonna make me righteous and holy. Another way that we struggle to respond to God's mercy in a way that honors God is we don't like to freely give mercy because we think that that makes us look weak. It makes us look powerless. It makes us look deficient in some way. And we never wanna feel like we're not in control. During week number one, Pastor Danny gave the example when he was playing that mercy game with his brothers and his brothers would hold him down and they would spit and they would let the spit hang over his face until he said, mercy, do you remember that? I will never get that image out of my head as long as I live. That was one of the, the grossest things I've ever heard in my life. And so growing up, like I got, a, I got brothers, I got a dad, like we all roughhouse with each other. And my dad didn't like spit on me, which I'm very thankful for. Like dad, if you're watching this, thank you for not spitting on me when I was a kid. But he, he would do something really interesting. Like he would, he would have us sit on the couch. Like my brothers and I are all pretty big and he would have us sit on the couch and my dad's got a grip like a gorilla. So we would sit down and he'd kind of pull us in and he would take his hand, he would make this raised like finger, like this knuckle. And he would put it right in the middle of our chest, like right on your breastbone. Like there's no meat there, there's no fat there. Even when I was a fat elementary kid, there's nothing covering that. And he would just take his finger and he would just grind it and grind it and push it in and it would hurt so bad. And I'm yelling at him like, let me go, let me go, mercy, let me go. And finally, he'd let you go. Now, mercy would dictate, if I want to respond in a way that honors God, that I'm not going to seek vengeance. But would my brothers and I do that? Would we grant my father mercy? No, absolutely not. No, we wanted to inflict more pain. And so we would resort to what we would call the fish hook. Do any of you know what the fish hook is? I'm seeing some puzzled faces. I get that. So if you want to fish hook another human being, say it's your dad. You take your index finger, you make a little hook, you put it inside their mouth, and you pull. I'm going to be honest with you, it hurts. It doesn't feel very good. It's not a great thing to do to another human being, but we did it to my dad and my dad hated it. But we didn't want to look weak. We wanted to go back at my dad. Full disclosure, I have fish hooked my mom. (laughs) I would not recommend that you do that. So my mom would be sitting on the couch. My brothers and I are all guilty of this. And so we would like sneak up behind my mom and we would like do the fish hook thing. We'd like reach into her mouth and we would pull, not to like hurt her neck, but like you would just inflict a little bit of pain on your mom just to mess with her. My mom's response was also not merciful. She would get up and just smack everything that was within reach. Like, what is the matter with you? And she'd just start smacking people. I have also fish hooked my wife. (laughs) I had forgotten that I had fish hooked my wife and I was like, oh yeah, I have done that. She was like, you're not gonna do that again. And I was like, okay, sorry. <laughs> so don't fish hook your mom, don't fish hook your wife. But we do that because we don't wanna look weak and we don't wanna look powerless. And that's kind of a fun way that, that we do that. But I think the, the last area where we don't respond in a way that honors God, this is probably the worst one. And if we fall into this trap, man, this is a difficult one to get out of. We, we take advantage of the mercy of God. It's almost like we view this mercy of God as this binding social contract. And we've found a loophole within the contract that allows us to just keep sinning and not really changing our heart in a way that honors God because we know that every time I mess up, every time I sin, he's gonna hit that mercy button anyway. So why change? What does it matter? I'm just gonna keep going and going because it's about what makes me happy. It's about just doing what I love. But that's not the case because as it says in Exodus, when we learned in week number one, God does not excuse the guilty. He does not do that. So there's a big question that we need to ask today, and it's this. How can we honor God's mercy with our response? Because if we miss this, if we don't get this right, we are in danger of missing out on the abundant life that God offers us. And I don't want that for anyone. So how can we honor God's mercy with our response? Luckily for us, we don't have to go very far. Today, Jesus is going to give us multiple examples of how we can respond to this mercy. And today what we're going to do is we're going to start in John chapter 8. So if you've got your Bible with you, crack it open. If you've got your phone, head to the app, open the Bible. We're going to talk about John 8 verses 1 through 11. And the story starts like this. Jesus is teaching outside the temple. He was an excellent teacher. Class is in session. All of a sudden these Pharisees roll up and they, they have this woman and they toss her right in the middle of his class, right in the middle of the circle. Now, Pharisee is kind of a churchy word. So if you're new with us today, Pharisee are these guys, they love the legalism. They think the laws of Moses make them holy. They think following the letter of the law is what's going to change them. They want to look pious and righteous, but they don't want to treat people the way that Jesus calls us to treat people. They want the public adoration based on their position, based on how they pray. So they take this woman, right, and they toss her out in the middle of this group. And here's what they say to Jesus. They say, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. 
What do you say? Puts Jesus in an interesting position in this moment. Now, I want to hang out here for a second because there's a couple things that you need to know. One, getting caught in the act of adultery about 2,000 some years ago, very big deal, as you can see. It results in death. The penalty of adultery back then was death. But where the Pharisees jacked this up was it was not just death for the woman, it was death for the man as well. If they were truly following the letter of the law, following the law of Moses, they would have brought the dude too, but they didn't. They messed it up. Now this law of Moses saying to stone her. When it says stone her, we are not talking about recreationally altering the state of your mind in a parking lot of your choosing. (laughs) What we are talking about is much more painful and much more severe. We're talking about stoning someone, taking rocks and throwing them at this woman in the middle of a circle until her life has met its end. That's one way you can stone someone. Another way you can stone someone is you could have the woman lay on the ground and you could progressively stack heavier and heavier stones on top of her until her rib cage collapses, her lungs explode, and she chokes on her own blood. You could also throw her off of a short cliff that is littered with stones at the bottom and then you could throw heavier and heavier stones on top of her until she meets her demise. This woman, as you can plainly see, is in a lot of trouble because she has committed adultery. Now, what's Jesus doing in this situation? Well, he does something really, he does something really interesting. It says Jesus takes a knee. He just kind of drops to a knee, and it says he starts drawing in the dust. That's really odd. It doesn't say what he's drawing. It doesn't say how long he's drawing. It just says he kind of drops in the dust and starts drawing with his finger. And what I take this to mean is it's almost like Jesus is bored because he knows why they're doing this. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to use his words against him. The woman doesn't really mean anything to them. They're just trying to use her as a pawn to get to Jesus. And in my head, I'm thinking, Jesus is like, man, you guys, your hearts are in the wrong place on this one. We've been over this before. I can't believe we're here again. But they keep pressing him. They keep pushing him. They're like, Jesus, what are you gonna say? Are we gonna stone her? Is today the day? Like, follow the law of Moses, Jesus. What are you gonna say? What do you say? So Jesus finally gets up and he says, all right, okay, all right. But let the one who has never sinned, you throw the first stone. You perfect in the back? Like, you want this one? You never made a mistake? Can you throw it? No. Online campus, can you throw it? Do you want it? You good? Garfield Park, Franklin Banta, Greenwood. Any of you guys, like, perfect sinless? Like, oh, you're all walking away. I see that. That's really interesting. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Jesus causes them to think differently. He causes them to realize that their perspective on this is way off. These guys, these accusers, as it's said in the Bible, which is really interesting language given that last week they called Satan the accuser. I thought that was wild. These accusers slip away one by one, oldest to the youngest, and they leave and they're gone because they realize my heart's completely off on this. I'm wrong. But that leaves the woman in the middle of the circle, this woman who was caught in adultery. Put yourself in her mind for a moment. What must she be thinking? She's moments away from death by stones being dropped on her skull. She's embarrassed. She's ashamed. She's publicly humiliated by these people that she doesn't know. And she's standing face to face with the one guy who's back on his knee again, drawing a porcupine in the dust. She's standing face to face with this guy who had the power to condemn her because he is sinless. And his response to her was mercy. Tears coming down her face, covered in dust. And Jesus looks to her and he asks two questions. He says, where are your accusers? Haven't even one of them condemned you? And she says, no, Lord. No, they have not. And he says, neither do I. And this is where we get the path. This is where we get the response. If we're going to honor God's mercy with our response, we have to adopt this attitude. Jesus looks at her and he says, now go and sin no more. Go and change. I want you to stop answering the messages on Instagram or Facebook from the man or woman who's not your husband or wife. You've been down that path before. It almost got you killed. Go and sin no more. There's nothing for you down that road. We've been down this path before. Instead of getting angry with your coworker that you got into it with during a meeting and firing off an email and CCing your boss because you're mad. I don't want you to do that anymore. There's nothing for you that way. 
Instead of losing it with your kid and getting mad at them when they take a marker and draw a tiger stripe design on the arm of your couch. I can say that because my one-year-old has done this. (laughs) Instead of losing it, I don't want you to do that anymore. I want you to go and sin no more. I want you to change. In fact, I want you to do number one of the three responses today. If we want to respond to God in a way that's going to honor him, number one, I want you to close the gap. Close the gap. Now, Pastor Danny has done an excellent job up to this point telling us what the gap is. So if you're new, the gap is this. There's Jesus over here on one end of the spectrum, perfect, sinless, amazing, absolute epitome of perfection, and then here's us getting mad at our kids, sending the email, cheating, adultery, like whatever. Like we're here in our sin. And there's this chasm, there's this gap. When Jesus says go and sin no more, he's not telling you to be perfect. He's telling you to not indulge in every single temptation that crosses your path. He's telling you to sin a little bit less. He's telling you to close the gap by changing your words, actions, behaviors, decisions, your environment, the people you hang, around, hang out with. If they're pulling you down, if it's causing you to give in to these temptations, you gotta change it. And for those of you thinking, well, you know, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was tempted. While he walked this earth for 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus Christ was tempted. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Led by the Holy Spirit, he was still tempted. You're going to be tempted. Put it in your calendar. Circle it so you're not surprised. But even though he was tempted, he did not give in. So it shows us it's possible to resist this temptation. It's possible. Change is possible. And we have to adopt this idea. Change is possible when you choose to close the gap. When you choose to sin a little bit less and change the things that you're doing. But some people can never get to this point because they get so hung up on the perfection idea. They think, man, if I'm never gonna be perfect, if I'm never gonna be Jesus, why try? Why put forth any effort whatsoever? I don't agree with that. That's like saying, well, I'm never gonna be an Olympic weightlifter, so I should never go to the gym. I should never lift weights. I'm never gonna be able to run the Boston Marathon and take first place and set a world record, so I should probably never jog around the neighborhood. I'm never gonna be a billionaire, so why should I try to get out of debt so I can be more generous to the people around me? It's never gonna happen for me. Winston Churchill would say it like this. He said, perfection is the enemy of progress. Enemy, I love that word there. It's the enemy. We can never let this enemy dominate our ability to close the gap. We gotta toss this enemy aside. But how do we do this? How do we show that we're changing? How do we close that gap? Well, John the Baptist would say it like this. He said, prove by the way you live, by the way you live, your words, your actions, behaviors, decisions, the way you treat people, the way that you give mercy, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Repented, also kind of a churchy word. If you're new, think of repentance as showing intense remorse or regret over something that you have done. Oh, I can't believe that I got upset when my daughter took a Crayola marker and she took it to the couch. Can't believe I lost it. Oh, God, please help me to be more merciful. Help me to be more forgiving. Help me to turn towards you instead of turning. Help me to close this gap. That's what repentance can look like. It's possible. So if change is possible, it's possible for me to close the gap. What does this look like, practically speaking? Have you ever heard of a guy named Nick Saban? Some of you, if you follow college football, you might have heard of him. So this is Nick Saban. He's the current head coach of the University of Alabama, one of the most successful college football coaches of all time. He has had to grant mercy to a lot of players over the course of his career. And I want to tell you the story of two of these young men today. The first starts with a young man named DJ Petway. DJ Petway, I'm betting you've probably never heard of this guy before. So back in 2015, 2016, DJ Petway was a freshman at the University of Alabama. He made a very crucial mistake. He decided to rob some people with about three or four of his other teammates. And it cost DJ everything. Scholarship, admission to the University of Alabama, role on the team, gone forever. It kicked him out. Now he got a second chance, an additional chance at Mercy by enrolling in this community college in eastern Mississippi. And he decides he's going to close the gap a little bit. He's going to change some of those words, actions, behaviors, and decisions. He's going to try to move away from that simple lifestyle and closer to God. So what's the result? Well, the result is he's an excellent student, excellent teammate, model leader on the team. And once the University of Alabama and his old head coach, Nick Saban, hears about this, they're going to give him some mercy. They're going to give him a second chance and they welcome him back to the team. Now, Saban gets killed in the media for this. I'm telling you, like he gets destroyed by media, professors, administrators. How could you let this guy back in? He robbed people. We don't need this guy. 
And in a press conference titled Nick Saban on Second Choices, which you can find on YouTube, and I highly encourage you to watch it after this talk, he had some really fascinating things to say. He said, I feel like there's a problem that we're too eager to condemn these 18 to 19-year-old kids and we don't give them a second chance. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, where do you want them to be? Where do you want them to be? Do you want them to be on the street or do you want them to be here graduating? So what happened to DJ Petway? Well, DJ Petway ended up helping the Alabama national team win two national titles by being an excellent teammate, an excellent role player, excellent leader on the field, changed his behavior completely. He graduated from the University of Alabama with a degree, and now he helps coach and mentor high school kids. Change is possible when you choose to close the gap. This is what DJ Petway had to say. He said, I thank God every day to be back here. It's a blessing. That's all I can say about it. It makes me appreciate everything in life, not just being here, but everything. He was able to allow that that gap closing to change and manifest itself into gratitude for God. Man, if you think that story's powerful, Nick Saban, prior to coaching at the University of Alabama, a long time ago, was a coach for Michigan State University, younger in his career. He had a wide receiver there named Musin Muhammad. Some of you might have heard of him. And this guy got busted with a gun that he didn't have a license for. He got busted with marijuana. And everybody was telling him the same thing. Saban, you got to kick this guy off. Get rid of him. And he didn't. He said, I punished him. I suspended him. I made him do stuff, but I kept him around. You want to know how this guy closed the gap? How he changed his life? Musin Muhammad spent 15 years in the National Football League after getting a degree from Michigan State University. He was awarded the 1999 Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for his work in the community as a Carolina Panther. He's the CEO of his own company that does charity work for kids. He's got seven children of his own, and at the time of the press conference in 2016, his oldest daughter was going to Princeton. You don't think change is possible? You don't think people can change when they choose to close the gap? If change is impossible, why would Jesus tell that woman to go and sin no more? Change is possible when you choose to close the gap. And as DJ Petway said, that that change and that life change can manifest itself into a deep love, which leads us to the second way that we can respond to God's love in a way that that respond to God's mercy in a way that honors him. Our love for God, your love for God, that can deepen. Your love for God deepens. I am so excited to share this next story because I know some of you have never heard this before. And it's absolutely wild. It's in Luke chapter seven. It's it's called Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. I'm gonna read it a little bit so you can kind of follow along. So it says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. So one of these legalistic guys, it's all about status and acclaim, right? So Jesus goes to this house to get some food. When a certain immoral woman from the community heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. So this lady hears that Jesus is going to be at this Pharisee's house and she just lets herself in. I really struggle with inviting myself places, so I'm a little uncomfortable at this point. Like my skin is like, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. And this is a Pharisee. This is like a high ranking religious officer in the community. She just lets herself in the front door. Then this is wild. She knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Why is she doing that? She's doing that because her love for Jesus Christ knows no depth. She knows how broken and sinful she is. She has no misconceptions that she's better than anybody else or Nothing, it's reckless abandonment. It's a complete and total abandonment of any hesitation to love Jesus because she knows that he is the one with the power to forgive her sins. She's accepted intimately her brokenness. The Pharisee has a much different response. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner, she's scum, she shouldn't even be in my house. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. (laughs) And he says, Simon, I'd like to tell you a story. And Simon says, go for it. So Jesus starts the story like this. And he says, a man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces of silver to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So what does he do? So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that, Simon? And Simon said, well, probably the one with the larger debt. And Jesus said, that's exactly right. 
the one with the larger debt. And then Jesus says to Simon, when I showed up here, you didn't anoint my head with oil, which is customary. You didn't wipe the dirt off of my feet. You didn't greet, greet me with a kiss. You didn't do anything. You just treated me like I'm just some ordinary run-of-the-mill person, like no regard or no respect for Jesus Christ whatsoever. This woman, all out love for me. She's turning the dust beneath my feet to mud with her tears. She's using her hair to wipe my feet off out of this deep love and, and appreciation for me. She has a correct idea of who she is in the sight of the mercy of God. You do not. My question for you today is, which one are you? Are you the woman who's on her hands and knees, wiping the feet of Jesus with her tears because she knows how broken she is? Or are you the Pharisee telling Jesus that there's grilled cheese on the counter? It's possible to allow your love for God to deepen when you have the right perspective, when you stop comparing the private sins in your own life to the public sins of other people and getting high and mighty in our thinking because I would never cheat on my spouse as I look at pornography in my house with the lights off. It's very easy to get in that trap. I'm begging you, don't fall into that trap. You can allow your love for God to deepen you can have that perspective. You can abandon the hesitation if you choose to do so. And once you get your head in that frame of mind, then it's time to take the test. Idea number three for you today. It's time to take the test. This is four weeks in the making. You didn't know there was gonna be a pop quiz today. There is. This third idea, how can you really be sure if you're responding to the mercy of God in a way that honors him? Well, it's simple. You show mercy to others. Really great way to start this test for you. Are you ready? Ask yourself this question. Do I do this? Am I merciful? When I have the chance to grant someone mercy, am I the type of person to give it willingly and freely as God does to me? Or do I want to stick the knife in and twist it and CC the boss and the boss's boss on the email? Which person am I? Now, I know, like, as a pastor, I know some people think up here, like, oh, man, he's probably got it all figured out. <laughs> I do not. Just because I wear a collared shirt and I'm up here talking to you does not mean that I've got everything figured out. I assure you, I need so much work on this. Guys, I have a six-year-old daughter, and she won't stop talking. <laughs> she won't stop talking. I can't explain it. From, from the time her little chubby toes hit the ground to the time her head hits the pillow, it's conversation. It's talking. It's questions. Like the car rides, we're talking about buffalo. We're talking about the sunset. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about what we had for dessert the night before. I can't get it to stop. <laughs> and I should show more mercy because it's her developmental level. She's curious. She's amazing. I know that. But sometimes dad just wants to play the quiet game in the car. And we do. And so I'll say, hey, quiet game's starting. We're going to start the game. Then she'll say something. Up, oh, dad's up 1-0. Dad's winning today. <laughs> I should have more mercy. I should give more mercy to my daughter because of the love that's been given, the love and mercy that's been given to me, not only by God, but the people he's placed in my life. Like the police officer I talked to at 6.30 a.m. this morning and the staff member who showed up at the door backstage as I'm getting ready for my talk. They knocked on the door Cody, you doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing okay. I set off the alarm, didn't I? And the police officer said, yes, you did. He did. I set off the alarm at church. I work here. I set off the alarm. 6.30, these people come and they show up. They should have been mad. They should have been livid. But instead what they said was, it's all good. You'll figure it out at some point. Not a big deal. And I'm like, oh, geez. Like, guys, I do not have it together. Like, we're all in this same boat together, which Jesus illustrates beautifully to one of his disciples in this last story I want to share with you today in Matthew 18. It's a story of this king going to his servants to collect on these debts. So the king goes to this first servant, and the first servant, if you're following along in Matthew 18, this first servant owed him millions of dollars. Millions of dollars! The most money I've ever owed anyone in my life is 10 bucks. I cannot imagine owing anyone millions of dollars. So this king comes, he says, hey, I'm here to collect the debt. And the guy goes to him and he says, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. He fell down before his master. He's begging the king. And the master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave the debt. <laughs> millions of dollars. If anyone forgave me millions of dollars of debt, I'd be forgiving people that hadn't even sinned yet. I'd be walking up to people in the streets. You're gonna say something really stupid today. I forgive you. 
You're gonna get in trouble at work. I forgive you. They look at me like, who is this nutcase? Like I would be forgiving everyone for everything. But this servant doesn't. Story takes a twist. When the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Millions, thousands, millions, thousands. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. So now it's turned into the Sopranos in the Bible. Now it's a mob movie. We're choking the man for a few thousand dollars. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it. The same response that this creditor had when he went to the king, right? But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. The exact opposite response that the king gave him. Man, I'm telling you, the servants that saw this, not happy, didn't sit well with him. So they go to the king and they tell the king about it. The king's response, woo! The king called in the man he had forgiven and he said, you evil servant, evil. That's the response. You can't give mercy to someone like I've just given it to you, evil. I forgave you the tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. You begged me. You fell down on the ground. You asked for this mercy and I gave it freely. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? If we all thought of ourselves as fellow servants instead of thinking as ourselves, the king, how would our world change? And that leads me to my question for you. Who is this for you? Who is this person in your life that you're withholding mercy from? You've been forgiven millions of dollars by God. Your debt has been paid, all of it. You could be forgiven people in Target if you wanted to. Who are you not forgiving? Who are you not showing mercy to over an argument, over a work email, over something that your parents said about the way that you raise your kids? Who are you not showing mercy to? And what is the response when we don't show mercy? Glad you asked. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. Jesus would tell his disciples, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. That is how seriously God takes this. I don't ever want anyone to be on the opposite end or to know what that feels like. I want God to be able to look at you and I want him to be able to look at me and say, you know what? They get it. They can pass the test. They do this. They show mercy. When they have the opportunity to exact vengeance or, or retribution, like they, they show mercy. They get it. They understand it. Who is that person for you in your life? Who's the servant whose hand, you've got your hand around their throat when you could be hugging them and pulling them in for an embrace and saying, I forgive you. Who is that? The last question I leave you with today. How will you respond to God's mercy? Massive idea. Not the easiest thing in the world to do. I grant you that. But it requires a response. Jesus Christ laid out the path before us. Go and sin no more. How do we do it? How are you going to respond to this mercy? Are you going to seek to close the gap? Is that going to be the aim of your life from this point forward? To close the gap between you and holiness? Are you going to allow your love for God to deepen? Are you going to be the woman on your hands and knees weeping at Jesus' feet? Are you going to be the person who treats Jesus as an afterthought? Are you going to show mercy to others? Are you going to identify that person or persons, plural, in your life? Are you going to extend the same mercy that you have been given yourself? Are you going to realize the millions of dollars of debt that you've been forgiven of by Jesus? Are you going to take that Are you going to extend the same mercy to the people around you? Luckily for all of us, we have a ceremony that we have been given that allows us to pause and remember the mercy of Jesus Christ. We call this ceremony communion. Some of you probably noticed the elements, the communion elements in the lobby as you walked in today. Our impact team members are getting into place right now. They're going to come forward with some buckets with communion elements inside. So if you didn't grab communion elements on your way in, that's okay. You can raise your hand and they'll hook you up with one. It's not a problem whatsoever. Now, what I would say to you is this. If you are someone who is not trusted in Jesus Christ today, that's perfectly fine. And we love that you're here. And I want you to come back because there's no place I want you to be. But 
This is a ceremony for those who have professed faith in Jesus Christ. So humbly speaking, we would ask you to just sit this part out. And maybe you can use this as an opportunity to pause and reflect on what you've heard today and think about it a little bit. But for those of us who have a relationship with Christ, this is our time to remember. Because I think something that we have forgotten, a reason that we've been given this community is that we have forgotten the mercy of God poured out through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the reason for communion. It's an opportunity for us to take time and remember. Life gets busy, things pop up, work things pop up. There are so many things that interrupt us and block us from remembering the mercy of Jesus Christ. The vivid imagery of just what he did for us. Jesus Christ allowed himself to be tortured, physically tortured in a way that is horrifying to describe. The nails that were put through his feet and that were put through his hands on that cross and those two beams of wood. He had patches of his beard ripped out of his face as he was being mocked. People were rolling dice in front of him, mocking him. The two people that were being crucified right next to him mocked him during their own crucifixion. A crown of thorns was placed on his head, piercing his skull and piercing his head, causing blood to drain down his face and into his ears and into his eyes. I can cause you to go blind. And he suffered this willingly for you so that you wouldn't have to spend eternity apart from God. What he did on that cross, the events leading up to it, that is what we remember today. That's why we're gonna take a moment. We're going to consume these elements. And during the last supper, the way that it's described in scripture, Jesus, he would take a piece of bread and he broke it and he distributed it to his disciples. And he said, take this bread, which represents my body broken for you. And I want you to eat this in remembrance of me. So with your element right now at our physical campuses, take out the cracker, or if you're watching online, whatever you have in front of you at your disposal, eat this piece of bread in remembrance of the body of Christ broken for you. During the Last Supper, Jesus also passed around a cup of wine and he said, drink this in remembrance of me for my blood will be spilled for you, representing the sacrifice that I will make for you. Now in this element, we have some juice. If you're watching online or any of our other physical campuses at this time, it's appropriate to open this element and consume it. And then after that, I will pray for all of us and then we will have a song. We're going to stand together and worship. If you need a few moments to sit and reflect, you are able to do that as well but drink this in remembrance of the blood spilled by Jesus Christ for you. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made. And, and most importantly, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you and to remember what you have done for us, the mercy that you poured out for us on that cross. Jesus, we come to you broken, acknowledging fully we want our love for you to deepen. Help us to take this time and let the worries and cares of the world fall down around us so that we can abandon all distraction and we can focus completely on you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this time of remembrance. Amen. A couple minutes ago, I was talking to anybody in here before communion who didn't make the decision to trust in Christ or haven't done that yet. I need your attention for like two minutes. Because what I'm about to tell you could be something that would allow you to make a decision that will change the trajectory of your life and your family's life for all eternity. Because what you've heard today is this idea of this mercy of God poured out through his son, Jesus Christ. What you really need to know is that Jesus Christ was a real man, a perfect, sinless man, the son of God who walked this earth and he really died for you on a cross, endured torture the likes that you cannot imagine but it wasn't for some innocent, it was, it was for all for a purpose. It was so that you wouldn't have to spend eternity apart from God. So he took the nails on the cross for you, for me, for my kids, your kids, your friends, everybody. He took the nails for all of us on that cross. And it wasn't enough that he covered the penalty of our sin with his death. He rose from the grave three days later. He was buried in a tomb and he walked out. If you are thankful for God today, give him some glory. 
But look, here's the thing. Like if you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ today, you have the opportunity to do that right now. You can make this decision. You can go to him just like that woman that we talked about in the story with the Pharisee when, he's, when she's washing the feet. You can go to him broken and say, I want to follow you. I want to be your child. Help me to do this. How do you do it? I'm about to say a prayer. You take these words and you go to Jesus right now. Receive his word, receive his love and allow it to change your life. Take these words from your heart to Jesus. I'm gonna say a simple prayer. It goes like this. Jesus, I come to you absolutely broken. Jesus, I make mistakes and I sin every single day. I acknowledge this. But Jesus, today, today, I am placing my faith and my trust in you. Jesus, I'm turning away from my old life and I'm choosing to follow you today. I accept your gift on the cross. I am thankful for it. I acknowledge that your death covers the penalty of my sins. And I am so thankful that your death means I don't have to spend eternity apart from your father. Jesus, I acknowledge that you rose from the grave. Wash me, cleanse me, Help me to follow you for the rest of my days. Jesus, it is in your beautiful name that I pray, amen. Now, if you just prayed this prayer, we are so excited for you. We wanna celebrate right now. Can we give it up right now for all these people who prayed this prayer? We have a gift for you because we're so excited. If you're online and you just accepted Jesus Christ, man, we celebrate this. Text the word SAVED to number 65248 and we will send one of these boxes to wherever you live. And at all of our physical campuses today, if you text the word SAVED to 65248, take your cell phone, fill out that form, head to the info desk in your lobby. One of our impact team members will hook you up with the SAVE box. It's got a New Believers New Testament Bible, a reading plan, and a coffee cup because we're kind of nuts about coffee here. Can we give God glory one more time for what he is doing in our community? Man, all glory to God, we are so thankful. Hey, I would love to pray for us all and then we'll kick things off to our local teams. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity today. We thank you. We thank you for your mercy. Help us to respond to this mercy in a way that honors you. Help us to close the gap day by day. God, help us to to allow our love for you to deepen into gratitude so that we can share that same love and mercy with others. And God, finally, we ask you, help us to show mercy with others on a daily basis just as you have shown mercy to us. It is in your perfect, amazing name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. At this time, we're gonna kick things off to local teams.